Well, do you have your Bibles? Yep. Well, that's a good start. That's a good start. Here at Calvary Chapel, we go through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. So you're going to need your Bibles this morning. If you would, open them up with me to Romans chapter 16 as we continue our study through this book called The Gospel for Christians. And right now, as you know, the title of our studies for the remainder of this book is Until We Meet Again. And here in chapter 16, as Paul closes his letter to the church in Rome, he does so by praising some of his favorite people in the way of greeting 26 of those brothers and sisters by name in verses 3 through 16. Now as we come to verses 21 through 24, we find the names of eight more brothers who are with Paul in Corinth at the time he's writing this letter, and they are extending their greetings now to the Christians in Rome as well. Today we will only have time to go through the first five names. Next week we'll go through the last three names and finish up that section. And then the week after we will, do, we will study Paul's blessing and his benediction that he writes in this letter. And then we will be done with the book of Romans and moving on next to the book of Philippians. And we're, we're going to start going through the prison epistles. And we'll begin with Philippians uh, in about three weeks. So that's what it looks like. And then after that, we'll have Easter. So we'll have a powerful Easter message from God's Word and, and get back into the book of Philippians. And as you know, on Sunday mornings why am I, or Wednesday nights, why am I going to all this? I don't know, but we're doing the book of Ezra right now on Wednesday nights, going through the Old Testament in the book of Ezra, which is a fantastic book. And I do, I know he's teaching, I think, this morning. Brian is, isn't he? But Brian, I hear, did a fabulous job teaching this Wednesday night, taught the whole book of Haggai, or the whole book of Haggai and did a wonderful job. And uh, he filled in for me because I was gone, and I actually asked him to do that since we were in Ezra because Haggai and Zechariah are the two prophets that prophesy at that time. And so anyway, I've heard wonderful reports about the Bible study Wednesday night. So uh, that has nothing to do with the Bible study this morning, but it's just... Um, since I'm just flowing with information, uh, I figured I'd just keep it going here. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be looking at verses 21 and 22 and actually going back also to verse 16. Now, as we get into this section, I like how Kent Hughes, a Bible commentator, how he describes the scene here in Corinth around 57 A.D., now imagine this, as Paul is winding up his letter to the Romans, and here's what he says, I quote. He says, as Paul nears the end of dictating his letter to the Romans, his friends gather around him in the home of his gracious host, Gaius. You'll learn about him next week. Tertius is writing down Paul's words, and Timothy, Jason, Lucius, and Sosipater really get into the long recitation of greetings that he is writing to real flesh and blood people. He goes on to say that these men that are around Paul, their hearts are so warmed by hearing Paul dictate this letter to Tertius as he writes it down that all of them begin to interrupt as he's writing, saying this, Hey, say hi for me, will you? Me too. Tell the Christians in Rome... We say hi along with you, Paul. That's what's going on here. And I love how he wrote that in his commentary on this. Because that's, that's the picture, you know, that you see here as you read this. So I want you to notice, with that in mind, Tertius writes in verse 21. Look at your Bibles. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. Now notice the first of Paul's companions mentioned here as sending greetings to the Roman church is a young man by the name of Timothy. Do you see that? First mention, top of the list, it's Timothy. Timothy was Paul's closest and most trusted associate, or as he puts it here, he is his what? Fellow worker. Do you see that? Look at verse 21. My fellow worker. Besides the name of Jesus Christ, Timothy's name appears more times in the New Testament than any of the other names in this chapter. Okay? Now, 
There is so much to be said about Timothy that we could literally spend our whole time today doing a character study of this young man. But for time's sake, let me just give you quickly a list of what Paul has to say about him in his other letters in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 4.17, Paul referred to him as my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 16.10, Paul said that Timothy was one who does the work of the Lord. That's why he called him a fellow worker here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, Colossians 1, 1, Philemon 1, 1, in all those letters, Paul called Timothy our brother. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul said that he was a fellow bondservant of Jesus Christ. Then he went on in Philippians... In chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, to say this. Listen to what he says about Timothy. He writes to the Philippians and he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. For I have no one like-minded. You know what the word like-minded means there? It means of equal soul. Today, in our culture, we would call call Paul and Timothy soulmates. They were like-minded. They were of equal soul. Okay? And this isn't in, a, in any way, shape, or form. Soulmates in a sexual way or an intimate way. That way. The passion wasn't that way. The passion was in serving Jesus Christ. They had a like mind. And Paul told the Philippians, Timothy, is, he's, he's like, I've got no one who's like-minded like this guy who will sincerely care for your state. But you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Wow, could you imagine the Apostle Paul saying that about you? Writing that about you to somebody? Impressive. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul referred to Timothy as our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. According to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he was a true son in the faith. Do I need to go on? I will. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 2, Paul called him a beloved son. Now, you guys know what that word beloved means, right? And we spent almost a whole Sunday talking about it. Yeah, a beloved son, a very dearly loved son. Timothy was a young man who became one of Paul's dearest friends as well as one of his greatest fellow workers and partners in the ministry. Timothy's name means... Honoring God. In Greek, it's Timotheus, and it literally means honoring God. But because he also honored Paul so well, he gets to be the first to send his blessing to the believers in Rome. Now, unlike Timothy, who, it tells us in Acts 16, was half Jewish. His father was a Greek, his mother was a Jew, so Timothy was half Jewish. And unlike Timothy... The next three guys mentioned here in verse 21 are thoroughbreds. All right, look at the rest of verse 21. Paul gives greetings to Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater. And notice these words, my countrymen. Some of your Bibles say my kinsmen. And he says, they greet you. The words my countrymen or my kinsmen simply mean that they were Jewish. They were of the same kin as Paul. Since none of these names are Hebrew, these men must have been Hellenistic or Greek-speaking Jews. The name Lucius only appears one other time in the New Testament, and that's in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, where a man by the name of, or known as, Lucius of Cyrene is mentioned there among the prophets and the teachers in Antioch, Syria. Now, here's what's interesting. Could this be the same man that we read about that Paul mentions here who is now in Rome? Could this be Lucius of Cyrene who spent time with Paul back in Antioch of Syria when he was there? Because if you know anything, and we studied it here recently, if you know anything about Acts 13, the Bible tells us there, Luke writes for us, that there were certain prophets and teachers 
there in the church of Antioch. And he mentions seven of them. And what's interesting is Barnabas is one, Paul's one, but then, or I'm sorry, five of them. Barnabas and Paul are one, but also Lucius of Cyrene is one of those men mentioned. Now, here's why I bring that up. If this is the same man, which it possibly could be, that means that Lucius was one of the three men there in Acts 13 who prayed for, laid hands on, and sent the apostle Paul out as a missionary originally. Now, if that's the case, then can you see why he gets second mention here? Allowed to give his greetings? Very interesting connections here. Now, the next name here in verse 21 is that of Jason. Jason. Now, like the name Lucius, the name Jason also only appears one other time in the New Testament. And I would like for you this morning to turn there with me. And that is found in Acts chapter 17. Hold your place right here in Romans 16. Turn to Acts chapter 17. During Paul's second, sickened, I'm sorry. During Paul's, not sickened, missionary journey. I've had sickened missionary journeys. They both happen to be to Africa. I've went on several missionary journeys and have never gotten sick, except for the two that I went to in Africa. Anyway, <laughs> that just hit me. Sick, sickened, no. During Paul's second missionary journey with his sidekick Silas, we read here in verse 1, look what it says. Luke writes and says, Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis, or Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Now, this is all in the area of what, what was called Macedonia at the time, uh, modern-day Greece to the south, Macedonia to the north. And they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Look at verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ, or I'm sorry, that the Christ, or the Messiah, had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, look how Paul applies it now, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Look at verse 4. And some of them were persuaded. These are Jews in the synagogue. Some of them were persuaded. Okay, these are some of the first Jews for Jesus right here. And look what it says. And a great multitude of devout Greeks. That's Gentiles. And not a few. My translation, a lot. Not a few of the leading women, important, influential women in the area, joined Paul and Silas. That means... They became believers. In verse 5, it says, But with revival, <laughs> there's always opposition from the devil. Anytime the Lord is doing something and he's working in the lives and hearts of people, Satan will always show up. And he usually does through people, especially religious people. Look what it says in verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, became, becoming envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring, him, bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Man, wouldn't you, be lo would you just love as a Christian to be accused of that? Now here, let me give you a little clue here. This is a false accusation. Because these men weren't turning the world upside down. They were turning it right side up. The world's already upside down because of sin. Okay, these men were turning it right side up. But to those who aren't right with God, it seems upside down. Verse 7, Jason has harbored them. Oh, no. And these all, I'm sorry, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Saying, there is another king, Jesus. Oh, boy. Now they're getting all political. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city 
when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Security was basically a bond or a promise that you're not going to let these guys stay here anymore. And then they let them go. And of course, as you keep reading on there in chapter 17, uh, they move on to the next place, Berea. So what's interesting is, is, is this. Jason is mentioned here. You see the name Jason? This is the other, other, only other passage of Scripture we find this name except for Romans chapter 16, verse 21 there. So, who was this guy? Well, I, again, I hate, to, I hate to do this to you, but it's just the, the thing you get with me being the pastor is when I hear the name Jason, being a child of the, of the 80s, I think of one, one name when I think of Jason. You know what I'm saying? Friday 13th. You guys know that stupid horror movie, Friday 13th? Yeah, I, as I was growing up, you know, I was forced to watch that stuff. That stuff scared me to death every time. You know, Jason Voorhees, he's the guy who came up out of the lake at Lake Crystal, you know, and, and would grab the people from the boat and all this stuff and kill them. Me and my wife were gone this week, spending some time alone, and we were in a cabin down in Branson, and they had a canteen, this pretty um, painted canteen in the bathroom, and it said Lake Crystal. <laughs> as soon as I... As soon as I seen it, I told Deanna, I said, oh, geez, I'm waiting for Jason Voorhees to come up out of something here and, you know. Now, I, I know I'm weird, so just give me this little bit of time to say I'm sorry, forgive me, and we'll move on. But when I, when I hear the name Jason right off the bat, this is what I think. <laughs> no offense, Jason. Seriously, no, I don't think of you this way at all. I don't. I don't. <laughs> but it's just... You know, it's, a, it's one of those names. It's just when you say the name by itself, you know, I see him coming up out of the water. Anyway, well, what's interesting is Jason, if you read our text here, what's interesting, right? Jason in Friday the 13th attacks people, but this Jason got attacked. So this is just the way it goes. The devil's always got a counterfeit. That's, I'll just leave it at that, right? You figure that out. So, so who was Jason? Well, as I've already mentioned, since he's a Jew with a Greek name, he's probably a Hellenistic Jew, Greek-speaking Jew. And what's interesting is this. It's his name. The name Jason is the Greek equivalent for the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua. Now, if you transliterate that or if you translate that over into Greek, you get the name Iesus that gives us the English name, Jesus. Isn't that interesting? So, Jason is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua, or literally we would say Jesus. And Greek-speaking Jews often use the name Jason in place of the name Joshua or Jesus. And I think it's fitting because how fitting is it that we see here that the name Jason means this. Here's what it means. It means he that will cure, or literally healing. That's what his name means. His name means healing. And it's interesting that physical healing was one of the hallmarks of the ministry of our Lord Jesus, was not? In Malachi chapter 2, verse 4, the prophet foretold that the Jewish Messiah would come as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. You know that one woman in the Gospels that Jesus healed that reached out and touched the hem of his garment? You know what the hem of his garment was? It was the corner of his prayer shawl, which the corner of a, man's, a Jewish man's prayer shawl is called the wing. This woman literally reached out and touched his wing and was healed. And we see this in the ministry of Jesus, all these healings. In fact, Luke, writing in the book of Acts, said that how God anointed Jesus Christ and he went about healing all of those who were sick and diseased and oppressed by the devil. This was the ministry of Jesus. And the Gospels prove that Jesus' ministry was one of healing because we have in the Gospels over 20 different instances of Jesus healing the sick. Now, living up to his name, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus living up to his name, Jason, Jason of Thessalonica 
provided something for Paul. What did he provide for them? Physical well-being. There were a group, of, there were a bunch of Jews who incited a bunch of lazy bums in Thessalonica. Literally, that's what it means. That mob, a bunch of lazy bums that were in the marketplace wanting money. They paid them to cause a riot to go after and harm Paul and Silas. But Jason protected them. Jason gave to Paul and Silas physical well-being in the midst of their persecution. We're told in verse 7 that Jason, look at verse 7, that he harbored. You see that? He harbored Paul and Silas. The word harbored means welcomed or received. And just like Lydia in Philippi back in the last chapter, Acts chapter 16, Jason was most likely one of the new converts in Thessalonica that we read about who had convinced Paul and Silas to stay with him. Jason was undoubtedly possessed with the gift of hospitality. He had that gift. In Greek, the word hospitality actually has two meanings. You should be familiar with them because we've already studied them in here in the book of Romans. But as we've already studied in Romans 12, 13, the word hospitality, the Greek word that's translated hospitality, means love to strangers. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, the same word means generous to guests. That's someone who's hospitable. But in Latin, the word hospitality means guest house. And it's from this Latin word where we get the English word hospital. And what's a hospital? It's a house to bring healing to strangers. That's what it is. Everybody comes into the hospital as a stranger. I mean, my goodness, you ever been in the, e in the ER? There's a lot of weird people in the ER, man. You, you, think, you, think, you think Walmart's weird, man. You know, you go to the ER, there's some characters in there, depending on to what, time of, what time of day you go in there, man. I've, there's been times I've been in the ER and been like afraid to be in there. Not because of sickness and stuff, just because I'm thinking, man, there's some crazy going on here. I'm just like, you know. But listen, no matter who you are, we all go to the ER. We're all strangers. Some stranger to the others, right? But we're all strangers. That's what a hospital is. It's a house to bring healing to strangers. And likewise, the house of Jesus. And what's the house of Jesus? Hmm? Are we okay here? Did I offend everybody that bad already? What's the house of Jesus? The church. So likewise, listen, the house of Jesus, the church should be a hospitable place. The church should be a place of love and generosity. It should be a place of help and healing. I'll tell you what, my, my heart breaks. It, you ask my wife, my heart literally breaks. When people visit our church and they come, and I, I, I tell you, it's been many, many times I've heard this. Of people coming to this church and are just overwhelmed the first time they come at the amount of people who welcomed them. And then they followed up with this. The old church I used to go to, nobody talked to me. Or I've been visiting churches and this, I've been to all these churches and nobody talks to me. Well, then you weren't in a church. You know what I'm saying? Right, you're in a, you're in a building. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that's not a church. A church is a, is a welcoming place that welcomes strangers. And if we welcome strangers, how much more should we welcome our brothers and sisters in Christ? Okay, again, the church is the house of Jesus, and it should be a place of love and generosity, help and healing. The late Methodist preacher Donald English once said this. He said, the church, listen, he said, the church is a community of the works and words of Jesus. I like that definition. The church is a community of the works and the words of Jesus. It's also been said that the church should be a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. Okay? Listen, even though we don't know much about Jason, and though he's not one of the most popular characters in Scripture... He played a very important role, nonetheless, in the ministry of Paul. And we see it here in Acts 17. Because of his courage, 
to house Paul and Silas, they were able to do what? They were able to share the gospel effectively in Thessalonica for over three weeks, for more than three Sabbaths. Do you see that? Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, that's Jason. That's him. David Guzik wrote this. He said, we can't all be popular to the same degree. You know? I mean, when I say, who's your favorite Bible character? I don't think anybody's going to say, man, that Jason guy's just got it together, man. I love him. He's my hero. He's not that popular. And guys, listen. David Guzik wrote, we can't all be popular to the same degree, but we can all serve and please God to the same degree in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I like that. That ought to be our aim as believers. Amen? Turn back with me to Romans 16 and let's keep going here and finish this out by looking at two more names. Romans chapter 16, verse 21. The fourth name we have here in this verse is that of Sosipater. Now, this is the only time this name is found in the New Testament. But an abbreviated version of this name is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, where a man by the name of Sopater of Berea. Berea, yeah, that's the town that Paul and Silas went to next in Acts 17 after they were there in Thessalonica. And back in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, so Peter of Berea is mentioned among the names of seven men, Timothy included. And these men traveled with Paul from Corinth to Jerusalem in order to serve as representatives from the Gentile churches with relief money for the poor believers there in Jerusalem. Remember, we've discussed this recently. Now, most Bible commentators believe that Sosipater of Romans 16.21 is Sopater of Acts chapter 20, verse 4. Now, if you would, I want you to look back at verse 16. Look at Romans chapter 16. Look at back, back at verse 16. And notice after Paul finishes his greetings to those believers that he was familiar with in Rome, he then says at the end of that verse, after he says, hey, greet one another with a holy kiss... He says, the churches of Christ greet you. Do you see that? Now, which churches is Paul referring to? Well, we don't know, but he was either referring to all the churches that he has planted, as some of your modern translations actually say, don't they? If you have a, you know, NASB or, you know, some of the newer translations, it actually says there, all the churches of Christ greet you. So it could be all the churches that Paul had planted. Or he could be referring to those Gentile churches that sent men like Timothy and Sopater to deliver their contribution with Paul to the church in Jerusalem. So he may be saying, here in verse 16, Paul may be saying hi to the believers in Rome on behalf of all those churches who gave money to send with Paul and these guys to send back to help the poor church in Jerusalem. That's what's going on in verse 16. Now let's move ahead and go to verse 22. And let's wind things down for today. Verse 22. Verse 22 says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. What? I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, I mean, who is this guy? I mean, this dude is claiming to have written this letter, right? Listen, I thought Paul wrote the letter. I tell what he says at the very beginning? He identifies himself as Paul. Well, Tertius is Paul's scribe. He's Paul's scribe. See, Paul had the habit of dictating his letters to a scribe to pin down for him. But Tertius is the only one known to us in the New Testament by name. Now here's the question. Why did Paul employ a scribe to do his writing for him? 
Everything's handled out there. That's no, that's no problem out there. <laughs> hey, everybody look up here. We're, we're good. That's all handled by the ushers. I know that guy, and he's no harm. And they've, they've got, we, we good? Okay. Just distract, distractions here, okay? So let me, let me hit this again. Paul had the habit of dictating his letters to a scribe to pin down for him. But why did he do that? Why did he employ? Well, besides being customary for the time, because here as he writes Romans, he's not in chains. This was customary for the time. People, this was normal for them to do this. It's possible, though, that Paul suffered from some sort of eye disease or eye injury that made it difficult for him to write on his own. Some Bible scholars believe that's, why Paul, that's what Paul was referring to in Galatians chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, when he said this. Listen to what he said. He said, You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject. In other words, though I had a handicap, you didn't reject me. You still listened to me. But you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Wow. He goes on to say, What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. See? Now, some Bible scholars say that he developed an eye disease on his first missionary journey going through Asia Minor. Some, people, some Bible scholars say that no, it was an eye injury that he suffered that left him handicapped visually whenever he was stoned and left for dead in Lystra there in Asia Minor. We don't know for sure. But one common Bible commentator pointed out that because Paul had poor eyesight... He couldn't write the small, tight script needed to preserve space on a sheet of papyrus or leather scroll. So he would dictate his letters and have someone else write them for him. And that's why when Paul wrote his epistle to the churches in Galatia, in his own handwriting, he didn't use a scribe when he wrote to the church when he wrote the letters to the church or the letter to the church at Galatia, the book of Galatians. He didn't, he didn't use a scribe. He used his own handwriting. And instead of using a scribe, he did it himself. And here's, here's what he says in Galatians 6.11. He says, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now what it means in the Greek is not large letter like the book of Galatians is real long. Because if you read it, it's, only, it's a very short book, very six. When he says with large letters, he's meaning physically. Lar- yeah, because man, dude, I can't see. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, now what's interesting is this. This has led many to believe that his thorn in the flesh that he refers to in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 was poor eyesight. Okay, now I want you to think about this. God is the one. Paul was already a highly educated, well-trained Jewish rabbi. I mean, his living came from reading and writing, okay? <laughs> Just like mine. I mean, I get Paul here. I really get Paul here. I get a little scared, too. When, well, my eyesight, at least, I, don't, I have close eyesight. It's the stuff far away I can't see. You know what I'm saying? So if you want to hide from me, go far away, and then I won't be able to see you. But I wear glasses, especially at night, because when I'm driving, I can't see things far away. Everything just looks blurry, which here's the beauty of marriage. Okay, just a little tip here. We're taking a little detour. The beauty of marriage is this. As me and my wife get older, I can't see it far away, and she can't see close up. So she has to have the, the readers, you know what I'm saying, on her, on her nose there to read small things. If I hand her something, say, here, read this. Where's my glasses? But then we get in the car, and she looks at me and goes, you got your glasses? Because I can't see things far away. So it's kind of like we work as a team. Okay, so you married people get that. Okay, you're both going to have weaknesses and handicaps as you get older and just learn to complement each other um, if you're so lucky to have, you know, those kind of handicaps where you're like, you know, I can see far away and you can see clear up or up close. So 
guess what? We're a great team here. See how that works? Married couples look to be a team with your spouse, okay? Don't work against them. Work with them. All right? Are we good here today? Man, I, man, I feel like everybody's mad at me or something. Here we go. Ready? Okay. I thought, man, somewhere I've... Okay. So here's the deal. Could this be Paul's thorn in the flesh? And I think it's interesting because Paul's whole ministry was about reading the Bible, reading it for others, reading it to them, explaining it to them, writing. The Lord called him. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, called him to write. But then you'll find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that it's the Lord who gave him this thorn in the flesh. It's crazy, isn't it? No, wait a minute. So the Lord takes the, Lord takes the proud, self-sufficient Paul and humbles him down to where he can barely write a letter. Okay? And says, now, here's what I want you to do. Now, Paul didn't know this in the beginning, but the Lord had called him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. How interesting is that? Listen, listen. Never use this excuse. Well, I think the Lord wants me to do that, or, or He commands me in His Word to do something, but I can't. Listen, if the Holy Spirit speaks to you and tells you to do something... His calling you is His enabling. If He tells you to do something, He will enable you to do it. If you read the Bible and He commands you to do something, His commandments are His enablings. He will enable you to do what He's called you to do. So why in the world then would the Lord, as He did with Paul, do with us many times, humble us down and call us to do something that we really can't do on our own. I'll tell you why. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's so that no flesh glories in His presence and that He gets all the glory. Amen. In fact, I want to show you this before we end today. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. So even though Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and it might have been his poor eyesight, here's what I would add. I would add this, that the Lord gave him the grace to endure it. Look what Paul says in verse 7. 2 Corinthians 7, look at verse 7. And Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Paul is saying, The Lord has delivered the gospel to me personally through revelation himself. And then earlier in chapter 12, he says that the Lord has given him visions. And Paul did. If you go read the book of Acts, he had different visions. And revelations. But Paul says, so that I don't think I'm all that in a bag of chips, okay? And that I think somehow because of my giftedness that I can do the ministry on my own, I can serve people and I can minister to them on my own, that I don't need the Lord, I can do this because I'm gifted. Paul says, so that I don't become exalted and take the glory that belongs to Jesus for myself. Look what he says. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. God gave him this. But he did it via, look what he says, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Why? Lest I get the big head and think I don't need the Lord. I am so gifted, I'm so wonderful, I'm God's gift to the world. I can do this on my own. I don't need the Lord. When we start to think that, that somehow we can accomplish God's 
work apart from His power, what we attempt to do is steal His glory. And you don't want to do that because the Lord makes it very plain in the Scriptures that He shares His glory with no one. Okay? This is very important. So He says that. Now look at verse 8. He says, Concerning this thing... I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Listen, just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed three times that the Lord would let that cup of his suffering pass from him, Paul also prayed three times that the Lord would take out this thorn out of his flesh. Now, do you you see there in verse 7, see the word buffet me? That's not buffet me. Okay, this isn't a scripture to eat eat all you want, eat all you can, right? It's not buffet me, it's buffet me. You know what buffet me means? Where it speaks of the thorn in the flesh, the thorn in the flesh is not a thorn like you think of a small thorn on roses or a bigger thorn like what you picture was on Jesus' head. A thorn in the flesh means a tent stake. Okay? A railroad nail. The God allowed a messenger from the devil to constantly... Buffet, okay, or constantly poke Paul with this tent peg. Man, now think about this. Have you ever gotten something in your shoe? And you're walking around, you go, I gotta get this thing out. And you sit down, and you know, man, you know you got a bowling ball in there. (laughs) Right? You pull your shoe off, what do you got in there? You got like a piece, of, you got like, a, like a piece of sand that you can barely see with your eyes. Isn't that amazing how that happens? It's like, man, this thing hurts. You open it up, and you're like, what was in my shoe? Where's that? Oh, there it is. It's that little thing. And it's the same way with your eyes, isn't it? You know, when you get something in your eye, you're done, aren't you? You're like, man, I can't, I can't, I can't do nothing. I can't function. I can do nothing until I get. This log, this splinter in my eye out, only to discover what's in there. Yeah, a piece of hair or another little piece of sand. Something as small as a piece of sand in your eye that feels like a bowling ball or feels like a tit or feels like a, a log or a tent stake. Can you see how Paul's feeling here? Lord, you've called me to take the Bible and Teach people and write and, and disciple and teach these churches. And i got to read your word and explain it to them and read it to them. And I've got to write to them. But I can't see half the time. So what did the Lord need? Or what did Paul need? He needed the Lord's help. And listen, regardless of how gifted you are today, It's the same for you, and it's the same for me. You need the Lord's help to do His work the way He wants it done. Okay, now we're about to end, but I want you to go with me here. Listen. Look at verse 8. He said, I pleaded with the Lord three times that might depart from me. And look at the Lord's answer in verse 9. And He said to me, He answered Paul, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see that? No, Paul, I'm not going to take... The thorn away. I'm not going to take the handicap away, the difficulty away, the disability away. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the grace to endure it. And you're going to find that in your weakness, I'm strong. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see that? When we are weak, He is what? Yeah. And when we have no power, what do we depend on? His power. Paul tells us. And then he says in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. The word infirmities means sicknesses, weaknesses, diseases, handicaps, difficulties. And Paul sounds crazy here, doesn't he? No, listen. When those things happen to us, what's what's our first response? We complain. Oh, Lord, this is so hard. This is so difficult. Take it away. Oh, you know but not realizing that God's going to supply grace for you each day so that what He does through you, 
he gets more glory from. And when he gets more glory, you get more joy. That's the way that works. He says, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am what? So I'm not enough, am I? No, our culture, you know our culture is preaching this message right now, and it's slipping into the church. You're enough. No, we're not enough. If we were enough, we wouldn't need Jesus. Okay? When I'm weak, he's strong. Now, as we close and wind things down and close here, listen. It's evident from Paul's ministry in the New Testament that he not only endured his disability, but he excelled in spite of it. Listen, Paul did not allow his disability to become his excuse, but he prayed and God used it for his own enablement. That's very important. And you know there was another woman who's became very well known in the church by the name of Fanny Crosby. You ever heard that name, Fanny Crosby? Well, if you haven't, write her name down and go Google search her. Listen, Fanny Crosby was only six weeks old when she developed trouble with her eyes. Her doctor was careless with the treatment, and his treatment that blinded her for life. But you know what? Fanny loved the Lord as she grew up. And because he had forgiven her, she came to a point where she had forgiven her doctor, forgave her doctor, and her blindness made her better, not bitter. Her blindness, she saw, in her blindness, she saw God more clearly. She wrote hymns, old hymns that are in the old hymn books. She wrote hymns more prolifically, and she guided people to God more successfully as a blind person. She didn't allow her disability to disable her, but she used it to enable her. Do you hear me? I know we're right at the end, and I know I'm over time, but I'm telling you, this is the punch of the thing today. If you hear nothing, hear this. She didn't let her disability disable her, but enable her. She wrote in her lifetime more than 8,000 hymns that are well known to the church, including a song that we sing here sometimes, and it goes this way. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Now, I like the second verse she wrote. Here's what it says. This is from a blind woman. She says, perfect submission. All is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. That woman probably would have never wrote those words if she wasn't blind. And you know how the chorus goes, right? This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Wow. That kind of praise came out of a woman like that. You don't know this, but there's a blind man from Louisville, Kentucky who leads a Bible study for others who are blind. And you know how I met him? He listens to our radio program. And many years ago, he wrote me, and he asked me if I would start sending our teachings to him. And since he can't see to read, the teachings, our audio teachings here at church, are one of the resources that he uses to study, to prepare himself for the Bible studies that he he leads. What a privilege. Isn't that incredible? 
He don't let his blindness stop him. And guys, listen, there are other dedicated Christians, such as, you guys heard this name, right? Johnny Erickson Tata, a paraplegic who ministers to disabled people all over the world, has an incredible ministry. And then there's a guy by the name of Nick Vojicic. You ever heard of him? Vojicic? You ever heard of this guy? He's the guy who was born without any arms or legs. He's basically a head and a torso with feet that look like little flaps. Seriously. Check him out online. He is a dynamic preacher of the gospel. And here's what's amazing. Both Johnny Erickson Tata and Nick Vojicic, in spite of their disabilities, they have excelled in ministry because of their disabilities. So here's our question. What's our excuse? What's our excuse for being lazy Christians? What's our excuse for not doing what God's called us to do or commanded us to do? See? It's incredible. Now, as I bring things to a close, there's another guy I'm going to tell you about real quick and I'll let you go. His name is Tom Dempsey. Does anybody know the name Tom Dempsey? Some of you may, some of you may not, but Tom was a place kicker for the New Orleans Saints in 1970. The Saints were trailing in a game to the Detroit Lions, 17-16, to and the ball was on their own 45-yard line. They had just two seconds left, and they needed a 63-yard kick. But no one at that point in the NFL had ever kicked a football more than 56 yards in a field goal. So the co- coach called his kicker, Tom, who was born with only half of his kicking foot, and a deformed right hand. And he gave the kick everything he had, and it went 63 yards, setting an NFL record that has lasted until 2013, when Matt Prater kicked one for only 64 yards. The record right now is 64 yards with a guy with a full foot. And he beat the guy who had the record for all those years, who had a half foot and a bad hand. Incredible. Listen, instead of allowing your disability or your weakness, whatever it may be, or your need, instead of letting your disability, your weakness, or your need become your excuse, here's what you need to do. You need to pray. You need to give it, give, it, give it to God and allow Him to use it for your enablement. Amen. Just like Paul. Amen. Listen, He does not want you just to endure your disability. God wants you to excel Amen. in your disability. Because you don't know how many other people who may be hurting and maybe even hurting the same way you are And because of what you've been through, you can connect with them. And you can minister to others. Not just limited to those kind of people, but them and everyone else. You know, there's some people that only some people can minister to them because they understand. You know what I'm saying? Now, Nick Vujicic recently said this, and I want you to listen. He said, you know, if you put the word go in front of the word disable, you have God is able. It comes from a guy with no arms and legs. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Guys, serve him with everything you got. Even if it's just a little. Give it to him. And he will do great things. My father's, or my, my wife's grandfather, years ago in church, used to get up and sing with a beautiful voice, with no music. Well, sometimes her grandma would play the piano for him, but many times I've heard him sing more a cappella, standing behind a pulpit. And there's one of the songs he used to sing, it went this way Little is much when God is in it. And that's true. But guys, back to Paul. Whatever his reasons were for using a scribe, Paul was accustomed to using one when he composed his epistles to be read in churches. 
But when it came to the end of his letters, Paul always, listen, like he did in Romans, at the end of his letters, Paul always picked up the pen himself to finish them personally. And we know this because of what he wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. Here's what Paul said. Paul said, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. See? Man, you didn't think you could get so much insight from Tertius, did you? <laughs> well, you know what? As for Tertius, we don't know if Paul instructed him to send his own personal greetings or not. But we do know it's something that Paul would have certainly approved of because he was greeting them. If you look back in Romans 16, verse 22, he said he was greeting them in the Lord. What's that mean? That means that even though Tertius is a Roman name, even though he was a Roman, he was also a fellow Christian. And so he takes that little verse, that little line in that whole book to speak for himself to say to the church at Rome, Hi guys, I'm the one writing this stuff down. Man, do you see how warm this is? Next week, we're going to pick up in verse 23 and we're going to finish looking at the last three names there. And I'm telling you, there's more insight to come. Let's stand because I got to get you out of here.